Okay, welcome ladies and gentlemen to this morning's live streaming event, uh, which is entitled Sustainability at the NDA. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is John McNamara. Uh, I am Head of Stakeholder Relations at the NDA, um, and I'll be your chair for this morning's uh, webinar. Uh, before I say anything further, I hope you've all managed to log in safely to today's webinar. Uh, if you do have any problems during the event or you know, if we lose connection with you or you lose connection with us, I will firstly just cover a few housekeeping points uh, that will be helpful in case you do get run into any difficulties um, and it, they may well help you get the most out of today's webinar. Okay, thank you, Dave. So uh, we're just gonna go through a couple of sl housekeeping slides here. So first one really, is about navigation uh, and it, this shows you the reception and the live session so obviously in the in the red circle there that you click on that to uh, on now to get into the live session which you've hopefully you've all done so you're listening to me now if you need to get back to the reception you just click on the three bars in the top left hand corner thanks dave okay asking a question this is very important at the end of the uh uh, web, uh, at the presentation, we're going to have a, a Q&A session at the end, which we, we really hope you'll join in. So to ask a question, it's quite simple. Um, again, on the slide, you should be able to see a circle around Q&A. So select Q&A, follow the, uh, then followed by the plus sign, which is in the, in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, type in your question and give a thumbs up to like other people's questions. Um, and uh, they are anonymous, but you can put your name in the questions if you like. And there's also two ways of viewing questions. You'll see under the Q&A circle, there's a, uh, there's a, a most viewed um, uh, button as well. So you can, you can, most voted button. So you can actually look at the questions as they come in in real time, or you can just look at the uh, questions that have had most likes. Okay, thanks, Dave. OK, troubleshooting, I just alluded to that. So if you do have any problems, any internet connection problems, uh, if you drop out, there are one or two things you can do. Um, so if you live, if the live stream stops, just press the activate button uh, to the uh, to the left hand side. If you can't hear, you can check if your volume is on and also check that the volume is on in the live streaming window as well so that is to the right there next to the cog you'll see some blue blue lines there that's your volume you can actually turn your volume up on the uh, on the live streaming uh, you can always try refreshing your browser and that age-old trick uh, known to all it specialists if you have a major problem you can always try logging on and logging back on again uh, logging off and logging back on again sorry uh, okay thanks dave uh, watching on a mobile device, if you're on an iPad or a phone, uh, the same functions are all available. So uh, you can select a Q&A to ask a question. And there will be a couple of polling questions at the end, which are just for our benefit to see how you've enjoyed the webinar and how we can improve them. So I'll ask those questions just towards the end of the Q&A session at the end. So uh, that's how you do it on a, a mobile device. Thanks, Dave. And finally, if none of that works or you do have an issue or do get into any difficulty, our partners at Marek, our PR company, will be uh, ready to help you get back into the webinar if there are any issues. And this is the best email address to get them on, online.events at marekpartners.co.uk. And if you contact them there, if you do have difficulties, they'll be able to uh, to put you back into the, uh, the webinar. Okay, thanks, Dave. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, well, I think that's uh, housekeeping covered. Uh, just before we begin... The main presentation uh, today from Alan Cumming, our Group Chief Operations and Im uh, Performance Improvement Officer, which will form the main part of today's webinar. I just wanted to take this opportunity to talk to you a little bit about the context for today and also how we're communicating with stakeholders during the current pandemic. And I suppose uh, many of you on the call will be working within the nuclear industry or working closely with the nuclear industry so you'll know that we always have a safety message or a safety share at the beginning of everything that we do and today's is really about well-being and about well-being during the uh, the current pandemic so firstly on that subject i do hope you're all keeping well staying safe 
during the current restrictions. Throughout this challenging period, the NDA has continued to engage with stakeholders using the best technical means at our disposal. And uh, I suppose today's webinar is another example of this. We are fully committed to engaging with you and we've found even found new ways to hold what turned out to be a very successful three-month public consultation last year <clears throat> using totally virtual means and not actually meeting anyone face-to-face. -face. So I suppose the key message is to keep in contact with people, to check in with people and to make sure your friends and colleagues are doing okay during these uh, unprecedented times. Um, it might interest you to know that during that three-month consultation, we uh, did a huge amount of events like this. We did personal briefings. We created a virtual exhibition online, and we even held a one-day conference, which over 160 people attended. Uh, and the interesting output of that is that um, we got more responses to, to Strategy 4 and the public consultation on Strategy 4 than we ever have before on any other public consultation and that's without any face-to-face -face meetings so i'm not saying that we should completely go about face-to-face -face meetings i want to be clear but it is good to check on in with people it is a good way of improving well-being and keeping people connected and it does prove that online and virtual communications can actually add something to stakeholder engagement you can com you can communicate with people much easier much more frequently and we tend to feel at the NDA that more people are joining our meetings so this is all a kind of a positive move so I suppose that safety share is just keep checking in on each other and look after each other as much as you can. Uh, for those of you who have been involved with our strategy four which is due to be published very soon uh, possibly in the next couple of weeks you'll know that we've striven to keep in contact and incorporate the views of our stakeholders in that strategy. Um, we've continued to talk to our community representatives, our local authorities, the NGOs, uh, supply chain and members of the public whenever we've been able to. So on to today. Uh, today's webinar goes to the heart of an issue that is really at the centre of our very complex and demanding mission. And it is timely as today is World Engineering Day supported by UNESCO. By taking part today, you are in fact joining a global conversation. Organizations and governments around the world are taking part in a huge range of li live streaming events just like this and discussing uh, uh, and reflecting and celebrating UNESCO's support for global sustainability. So being part of today is, means that you're part of something much bigger on a global stage. Now, sustainability can mean different things to different people. We're fully aware of that. But as far as the NDA is concerned, it's about future generations and it's about legacy. Uh, it is about how we enable our 17,000 employees to support our sustain sustainability aspirations while working on what is undoubtedly Europe's largest environmental clean cleanup mission. And it's also about how we engage with you stakeholders to ensure that we're taking forward that mission in the most appropriate way. When we talk about legacy, we mean the legacy of our 17 nuclear sites around the UK. We mean the socioeconomic opportunities that we create for those communities when we've left. And we mean the legacy of a robust engagement with our staff and stakeholders to underpin collaboration and to help us achieve those aspirations for a sustainable future. Anyway, that's enough from me, that's the context over now to the main act today. So it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Alan Cumming for the main presentation. Just one th one final thing from me, you can ask questions at any point during the presentation. So please use that Q&A uh, button to ask those questions um, and we'll take those at the end and uh, we look forward to uh, reconvening after Alan's presentation. So Alan, the floor is yours, thank you. Well, good morning and thank you for your time. Um, it's really appreciated. This is a really important issue for all of us and something I'm passionate about. And I believe we need to take a lot of time to think over before we act. So putting that in context, nuclear power provides 10% of the global electricity. In the UK, it's, at, it's about 20%. It peaked in 1995 at 25% and currently there are 442 reactors, 53 in build and 93 planned. But 
they are coming offline. And since the 1970s, 64 billion tonnes of CO2 has been avoided. But there's a change in er energy mix. And the hard reality is that the power plants and the nuclear fuel reprocessing plants are now coming offline. It's a global business that's increasing in decommissioning. And I'm going to talk to you about those in the UK and how we're delivering future sustainable legacies from assets that have served the country for over 60 years. Next slide, Dave, please. But first, I need to take you back in time, back to the 30s and 40s, when British nuclear scientists were really getting to grips with the technology. Coming out of the Second World War, there was a need for nuclear fuel and wind scale in 1950 commenced construction. That realisation of a power capability moved quickly in 1956 to Calder Hall power station being opened on the wind scale site and the Queen opened that in very ceremonial fashion, the first commercially operated nuclear power station. The technology and creativity of those in the past really accelerated. In 1962, we had the Dunry fast breeder reactor. We commenced the reprocessing of Magnox fuel in 64. And then the last reactor for a uh, Magnox reactor was built in 1971. Moving through the timelines, the advanced gas reactors of which there are 26, was, was built and Hunterson B came online. Our thermal oxide reprocessing facility in 1994 became operational. And then in 2005, the NDA was, were formed, or the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority were formed to deal with this legacy. Um, following that, we had the end of process, the last Magnox reactor in 2015, and in the last year, take, take, uh, removed all the fuel. So that brings us up to today. Next slide, Dave. Where are we today in the UK? Well, we've got 17 sites, 17,000 employees, and 11,000 of those um, are based at Sellafield or in the support office in Warrington. The NDA spend £3.2 billion a year and they have a revenue of about £800 million. And we've got sites from John O'Groats and up in the north of Scotland at Dunray down to Winfrith and Dorset. So an extensive and geographically spread range of sites. You'll notice the fell site CHP. I've deliberately put that into the presentation because we still have challenges around emissions in our future energy challenge. But all in all, we're doing an excellent job in delivering the safe decommissioning of the sites. And I think our regulators have a huge role that they're playing in this. Next slide, Dave, please. So why is sustainability important to us? It's absolutely a key strategy that we are driving to ensure that not only are we dealing with the past but we're creating a future as well. We have a total commitment to a sustainable future and our intent is to be the global leader in nuclear decommissioning and, and the UK to provide a central role across the globe and how we'd go about this. Next slide, Dave. I want to give you some examples of those legacies that were listed in the last slide. The first one's the environmental legacy. And, and again, giving you some tangible evidence around what we at the NDA and our, our subsidiary and companies are doing. We have taken time to understand our, our carbon footprint. We formed a steering group. In addition to the steering group, we actually formed a rising star advisory group. And that group of rising talent have brought another angle. They are going to inherit the legacy of what, what we do and will act as custodians. So it was important, we saw it was really important for them to be involved 
in the executive decision making around how we deal with sustainability. And my environmental director's done a tremendous job in driving our carbon net zero agenda. We do have a 90 year old hydroelectric power station as well. And it's in my background here um, up in North Wales. It's important that it gets embedded into the, the organisation that the desire of achieving carbon net zero is part of what every one of our employers desires and wants to join the NDA and the NDA companies for. Next slide, please, Deb. Looking further at our environmental legacy, we've been working really hard in our rail business, the direct rail services, and they've re reduced their carbon footprint by 25% over the last two years. Of course, technology and innovation pro is, is absolutely crucial to achieving our sustainable goals. And that's an area that we really are looking for our supply chains and from other industries to help us. It's really important that we address the, the demands on our environmental legacy through the introduction of technology and innovation. And we must be embracing that fully. Also looking at our travel. So in the NDA, we travel, we've traveled 30 million miles, um, 9 million by train, 5 million by air, 14 million by driving, and 2 million by bus. But you can see by the geographic spread, travel is an important part of our carbon footprint. And we do look at it. Water usage is an important part of what we're looking at as well. We use 7 million meter cube. is used at Sellafield and Sellafield have also reduced their carbon footprint by 12% in the last year. So we're making an inroads but there needs to be more in the environmental and we're now setting ourselves up with the help of our supply chains, with the help of government and the key input from our regulators and how we can drive this agenda further. Next slide please Dave. So we move on to the decommissioning or what I would call the technical legacy. You know, we've got masses of really bright engineers and they come from all spectrums and very diverse uh, inputs from them. But returning the sites to land is part of our mission. This photograph here is, is down in Dorset. It's our Winfrith site. Uh, the Magnox Winfrith site, and it did have, I think, about nine or ten test reactors on the site. There's now three left, um, two that you can see there just now, and, and uh, another larger one. But largely, a huge amount of land is being passed back to um, the Dorset Innovation Park. So, ten hectares has been passed back. At Harwell, where we have another Magnox site, 25 hectares has been handed back to the Science Vale Enterprise Zone. And obviously new technology is really a, a, a key focus for the Harwell campus. So we're dealing with returning the land back to where it was. Next slide, Dave. Thank you. Right, just building on that decommissioning legacy, this is a really good news story where Waste is ultimately our, our output and it needs to go somewhere. So we, we have low level waste, we have intermediate level waste and we have high level waste. The low level waste or very low level waste goes to our repository and rig and you can see Sellafield in the background and they're connected by rail. We have been working with Momentum Studswick um, as a supply chain and they've been running this and have achieved a significant waste divergent of 95% of the waste that used to come has been diverted to other sources, whether it be smelters or certified energy recovery facilities. And this low level and very low level waste, what I'm talking about is uh, protective equipment, uh, equipment items or mops and things like that. So it, it's, it's uh, uh, the best way to deal with this waste and as I say, a 95% waste diversion is huge. And that's avoided 230,000 
tons of CO2 um, for treatment in transport. So a real success story and again something that we continue to look at. How do we deal with our waste? Next slide please. That takes me on to the socioeconomic legacy. Really important to the, the country and if you look at the situation we have decommissioning these facilities we've got tremendous talent and skills well how do we convert that into the future and how do we ensure that uh, the communities that, that have so steadfastly supported the industry um, are kept alive and kept buoyant i wanted to give you a couple of examples of this and we've got lots believe me all over the country at all of all of our sites and we get huge support from both the national governments in Wales, Scotland and England, but also we get huge amounts of support from the local authorities and local councils. And I'd like to thank them for that. And, you know, we we absolutely have a focus here. Couple in the Energy Coast, as we, as we call it up in Cumbria, uh, Campus Whitehaven, where we invested £10 million. This is a bringing two special needs schools together. And again, uh, a significant contribution to the local economy and needs. Secondly, the facility which we call Energus, which is just outside Whitehaven. Again, looking at that, that was a £10 million investment um, on top of investment from, from other parts. But largely, this is where we train our apprentices and nuclear graduates for the future and give refresher training. So, so this is an investment in the future. It's an inv investment in people. It's an investment in the industry. And we see it as a key uh, facility for the entire estate and for the country. It's a country's asset that we can use. And that was built in 2009. Could I have the next slide, please, Dave? Aha, moving north to Scotland. So. It is absolutely stunning up there. I'm going to give a, uh, uh, an advert for the Scottish Tourist Board, but if you get the chance to do the North Coast 5,000, 500, sorry, uh, get up there and you wouldn't need to walk it, as the proclaimers would say. So, you know, we're doing again a lot in the north, up in the, the, the north of Scotland with the Keith Ness uh, area. Wick Harbour, we've spent a million pounds in supporting the protection against violent storms. Um, Scrabster Harbour, which is just down the road, if you like, from Doon Ray. Again, another £5 million investment, 50 jobs. At, uh, at Wick, obviously, maintains the port jobs. And then on the other side there, we've got the, our nucleus facility, where, where we archive all our documentation and many documents from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s uh, are, are there um, just beside Wick Airport. And again, that's created 40 jobs. It was an investment of £21 million. And uh, again, like Scrabster and Wick are hugely important to the area. Scottish ports and British ports in general are going to be very important to the economy. Um, only recently, or in August, sorry, last year, it feels like recent, I was at uh, the site and there was a cruise ship um, off, off, off the harbour. So these communities are far more accessible. You know, we can now communicate with, with our, our friends up north really easily. We're looking at links with the oil and gas industry and their waste streams and how we can create more jobs and, and activity in the north. Could I have the next slide, please, Dave? Right, well, people really matter. I mean, nothing gets done without having people who are engaged and really are passionate about what they do. And what's came to the fore for me, and I'm going to start at the bottom here because that's the, the most important um, slight bit for me, along with diversity, is mental health and well-being. John mentioned it in the safety message, but it's really important. We are taking a real strategic approach, treating mental health in the same way as physical health. 
and we will have the right capability to drive us to a position where we are not only looking after the bodies, but we're looking after the minds. And Adrian Simper, um, our Group Director of Strategy, has really contributed a lot of personal input to that. Edie and I, yeah, people say it, but it mean, it's means a lot to us. We have to change the way we are. So the cultural legacy has to be one of change and it's going to evolve and it's going to involve making sacrifices. It's going to involve being involved. We, you know, I think people need to get involved. Don't just leave it to others. This is about us all working together across all our 17,000 people, but also the communities we're in and also our supply chains and those that we associate with, it's really important to us. So the cultural legacy is something that we're looking at across the board and we are trying our very best to do the right things for all those involved. Next slide, please, David, thank you. Right, okay. So here's the, here's the summary. I think, are we doing enough? We're doing some good stuff, but we can do better and we're going to do better. So we've got a be what we call a beacon project on sustainability. We're bringing together the legacies and we're actually looking at a, a more structured way of bringing this together. So you'll be hearing a lot more from us. I want everybody out there to be trying to copy what we're doing because where we're going is going to be at pace. We will be relentless. So the decommissioning strategy and decommissioning legacy is one we should be proud of, one that we can develop and share, not just with, uh, with those in the UK, but elsewhere also. We must embed how we work technically into our designs and really make sure our commercial decisions are cognizant of what we're trying to achieve. Technology and innovation is going to be crucial here in health and safety and environmental and in how we operate and how we decommission. We have the challenge of taking these fairly sophisticated pieces of equipment and, and and putting them to bed. The environmental legacy. Wow. As, as John said, we we are an environmental cleanup company, so we have to be in the top of our game and we will be in the top of our game. So we must respect our environment and contribute to it. I've got a fantastic leader in the environment and I'm in no doubt that we are going to make huge steps forward. Now that we understand exactly where we are with environmental, our, our carbon footprint, we now know the areas where we need to tackle on reduction um, of, of our emissions. And also we need, absolutely need our supply chain and those that work with us to come with us in this journey and to contribute and to input and to help as well. It's something we need to do together. The socioeconomic legacy is really important, not just for our communities, but for the country. We must try and redistribute wealth. We must try to bring prosperity to areas and we must continue and try and do our best to take the skills that we have and convert them into the future. So the, the Under Secretary for, for Climate Change in Scotland was asking me, but how are we going to do this, Alan? And, and my view is the environmental industry is going to give it a lot more jobs. I think our skills and our technology skills will be converted. In 10 years' time, the companies that we're talking about now will probably hopefully still be there, but there'll be a whole lot of new companies as well, particularly in digital, definitely in um, high, high manufacturing at highly high grade fat manufacturing and we must work with other industries um, within our communities to bring together a more sustainable solution for the communities that we're in. And the cultural legacy, 
that's really important because that's what's going to really transform. If people really believe in their hearts and minds that this is the right thing to do, and if anybody's watched Simon Reeve recently, um, you know, the planet is not going in the right direction. You know, we're cutting down too many trees. And it may feel that whatever we do maybe isn't enough. And maybe it's not, but it is. Believe me, it is. We all need to pull our weight here. And the culture needs to be taken in the direction of care, not just for ourselves, but for others. And more importantly, for our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren and those in the future. So that's how we, the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority, are going to approach sustainability in the UK. We hope some of it will rub off um, and we will be publishing our sustainability report um, in the next day or so. So please try and uh, log on to that in the government, uh, the NDA part of the government website. And I want to leave you with this thought. What can you do? How can you help us? How can we all work together to come up with legacies that really do make a difference? Because here at the NDA, we're going to be passionate, we're going to be focused, and we're going to be absolutely relentless. Thanks for your time. I really do appreciate it. And uh, join us in the journey. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you Alan, thank you, for Alan, that. Uh, much appreciated. Much appreciated. Uh, we're going uh, to move on to questions quite, quite soon. soon. Um, sorry, I'm just getting a bit of feedback in my phone at the moment. Okay, so thanks again, Alan. Alan. Um, the, key the key question, I think, for us, for us which is coming through, uh, well, there's certainly plenty of questions coming through, which is great to see, and thank you for that. Um, probably start off with this one Alan uh, it's got 13 likes so it's obviously a, a, a popular question but it's uh, the question is how is the NDA ensuring decisions are made with sustainability outcomes in rather than simply financial outcomes that's a really good question and uh, I think this comes through um, policy as well so which sounds like a bit of enforcement, but but actual fact, the push that we are getting from our client, uh, the Department of Energy and Infrastructure and Strategy, um, is very much that business cases will have a sustainability component to them. So it's not all going to be about money. But my honest belief is that the business decisions, and Terry Ahern at SEPA, is, the CEO of SEPA is really good here. You know, we need compliance, but but beyond compliance for, for business benefit. So I believe that the, the business benefits, the economic benefits, will come by taking the right sustainability decisions. But, but in the short term, to, in order to get us in that journey, uh, the business cases that are put forward will have... Uh, components around and we are being asked for that now from government you know what is the carbon impact what is the uh, sustainability input from a socio-economic viewpoint as well um, we spend 90 percent of our, our money on uk-based companies i'm not saying uk companies i'm saying uk-based companies um, but we, we 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 cannot convert you know, concrete, the industry, uh, not just the nuclear industry, but all industries are looking at, are there better ways than concrete? And we're in that zone as well. So this is a test of our engineers. Um, but the way forward here is that, that we need to build it into our thinking and the cultural legacy. Um, won't happen overnight, but I can see tangible examples at Sellafield in particular where the construction supply chains along with Sellafield are looking at how carbon is reduced and how we can actually address. Hopefully I've gave some examples as well. The you know the ben business benefits to DRS are huge in addressing carbon uh, footprint. Hopefully that answers the question. Yes, no, uh, thanks for that, Alan. Very in-depth question. And 
it's still getting votes that question actually it's up to 17 votes so we're top of the hit parade at the moment so a good question and a, a great answer thank you alan uh second question i suppose which is is getting a lot of interest on the uh, on the webinar is uh, you said sellafield had reduced their carbon footprint footprint by 12 percent over the past year is this because of the ramp down in operations due to the covid pandemic or is it something we can expect to see moving forward um so there's two points to that i think pers- i think sellafield did excellent during the, the pandemic um you know we, there are some critical s- services that sellafield provide to keeping the power stations the nuclear power stations on in the uk so those operations continued and i think over the last over Christmas, the, the reprocessing facility, the Magnox fuel reprocessing facility, um, was at huge, really good levels. So whilst there may have been uh, a reduction in numbers at site, the actual work that was undertaken was still happening. Um, yes, we had the issues around separation, quite rightly so, in 1950s buildings so so there is an impact in productivity but but uh, uh, my belief is there's Sellafield have got a plan and they are doing more to address carbon footprint I think if you look at our figures a lot of the the Fellside CHP is a is something that needs to be looked at that's the biggest part of our carbon footprint then the estates our whole energy strategy needs to be looked at, I would say. Um, uh, and again, we've got the emergence of other technologies, whether it be small modular reactor or fusion that, that, that you know that's coming along as well. And we've got the deep repository that's under consultation at the moment, or or sorry, on yeah, with with communities. So I think there's there's opportunities. For, for the entire estate to make reductions. Sellafield's where the biggest opportunity is on a scale viewpoint, but that should not take away from the fact that uh, all of us need to try and, and improve. I'll give you a really good example um, of the interconnectivity um, between us and other industries. So our real business moves the nuclear fuel, spent nuclear fuel around, which is, which is its primary purpose, but it also moves Tesco's uh, uh, goods around. So it's been helping to make sure the co- co- country's been fed. And there's another example where Brewdog, the beer manufacturer in Scotland, have converted from road, road transport to rail transport, and they're using DRS. And they're now carbon negative. So they've used our um, rail business is a way of getting carbon negative. And I think we need to search for these interconnections and opportunities um, to not just address our own carbon footprint, but those that we serve. Thanks for that, Alan. It's probably just worth mentioning as well, of course, that, um, you know, we've done a lot of work at our sites during the pandemic to ensure that workers can go back onto site and work safely and, and there is a quite a huge amount of work still going on at all of our sites particularly Sellafield so maybe not firing on full cylinders as yeah. we were pre-pandemic but certainly a lot of lot of people in work and working on sites and, and taking the mission forward. Yeah working safely that's been paramount in, in our thinking and obviously we've got sites in Scotland, England, Wales so you've got differing conditions um, but, but, you know, the unions that we work with have been, you know, there's been huge engagement with them because the safety of our people is our, our priority. You know, the, the amount of cases has dropped a lot, but we're still on high alert. You know, we still want to make sure that we, we, we don't have any more situations um, moving. So, yeah, thanks, John. Okay, thanks, Alan. Uh, next question, I suppose. I'm, I'm doing them in the order of how they're getting uh, uh, voted on, but I will try and, and, and mix it up a little bit. But the next question is, uh, again, a good one, I guess. Uh, it's got 14 likes so far. So in lieu of sustainability leads departments, so the guy, the people on the ground who are working these areas, whose role is it to drive sustainability initiatives at the NDA sites? Is it the commercial teams? Is it the environmental teams? 
or is it under social impact or, or how does it all come together i guess that's a, a really tricky one, that one. <laughs> question it's a really good question because it it really tests the organize the traditional organizational structures um i I don't know who asked who put that question in, but however it was, really good question because this isn't just about nuclear decommissioning. This is about organisations and how they actually bring sustainability into their organisation and the interconnectedness, hopefully that's a word, of how it's all brought together. So, so the answer would be everyone. Everyone, it's, it's not... We we had some real challenges. It's quite funny because being the, the type of organisation we have got lots of engineers, and of course engineers like A plus B equals C. Sustainability is not like that. So it's it's about how we bring things together. It's about how we act. It's cultural, and that's why cultural legacy was left to last because that's the glue that brings it all together. And so, yes, we have a director of sustainability. Um, I took a long time to make sure we get the right person. And David Stranati, we did. Um, the environmental director, Steve Hardy, hugely important. I feel like I've, I'm the football manager for a team that's got, got Messi and Ronaldo in the same team. So they, they bring the expert inputs but how you connect it in is is some magic dust, to be honest with you, because it doesn't sit naturally into the traditional structures. And and uh, having a chief sustainability officer or a director of sustainability is a real commitment by the executive and board to this, to coordinate it, to get the right advice. It's, it's more about stewardship and support rather than I'm leading and this is what we're going to do. And within the businesses, the businesses, um, interestingly, some have a sustainability person, some don't. Um, but what we'll try to do is, is, is get the right solution for each of the businesses and, and provide a, a, a burning star, if you like, of direction that we need to travel. If you're looking for an A to B in road back, forget it, it's not there. And I think each company, what its values are, what its mission is, how it connects with people, is going to be diff sustainability is going to be different for everybody. So I know that's a long answer, but it was a really good question because I'm looking at other organisations I'm involved in and they're struggling to, to cope with what do we do with this and how do we deal with it? But actually, it's in the fabric of what you do. Thanks, Alan. That's, that's, a, that's a great answer. Uh, great question as well. So thanks again for that. Some, some fantastic questions are coming through here, which I hope you, you can all see and, and vote on. And another very popular question, I'll just ask this. Uh, how, how is the NDA aligning ambitions to the UN Sustainability Development Goals? So it's quite a specific question there, aligned yeah. to the, the UN progress on this. Yeah, where we can, we are. I think that's a high-level answer. Um, are we where we need to be? No, we're not where we need to be. I think we need to be, um, you know, I said at the end, we're going to move at pace, but we need to make sure that we know the the direction that we're going and, and that we're not promising the world as well. Mm. This is going to be a journey. So, yeah, we're aligned with it. We're going to do our best. Um we will be realistic and we will we will absolutely try and be brave and lead in that area. That's great. Thank you, Alan. It's, it's, it's worth mentioning that we, we're linked into so many international organisations because decommissioning is an international industry, isn't it? I mean, every, everyone yeah. from the IAEA in Vienna through to the... Um, the OECD and the Nuclear Energy Agency. We're working all. We're really working in tandem with all of them, aren't we? And yeah. uh, to, to 
to the same end. So it's it's a good question and, and a good answer. Thanks, Alan. Um, I've got a, a a supply chain question now. I thought I, yeah. we probably would get a supply chain question. I mean, there are quite a few members of the nuclear supply chain, I think, calling in and obviously very interested in this whole area of sustainability. So it's the straightforward question, I guess, we, we, we should expect to get. But how is the NDA working to actively deliver sustainability in the supply chain? Well, uh, first of all, the sector deal is going to be a key vehicle for that, the, the nuclear sector deal for those nuclear suppliers. Years ago, I think it was when I was with EDF, I helped the Advanced Manufacturing Centre create the Fit for Nuclear programme. And I think, you know, we need organisations that work, work out with nuclear as well to, to work with us because 75% of a new nuclear power station um, isn't nuclear. So I think we need to, we are changing our approach. Um, obviously, there'll be requirements within our contracts. Um, you know, you know the earlier question around how you're going to make this stick. Well, you know, our requirements in our contracts that we place will be quite clear. But more so, I would say that, that we need to have uh, a two-way street of listening and learning. There's lots we can learn from our supply chain, um, that, but there's there's a lot we need from our suppliers to do as well, particularly in innovation. You know, 25 years ago, we we're working on concrete and camp or cementation encapsulation plants for nuclear waste. We're, st if we're still doing that. Is that really the solution? You know, the the so I think that's a two-way street. You know, our demands of our supply chain. Um, from a sustainability viewpoint, um, they, as a client, we need to be um, as good as our supply chain, if not better. So they should test us and challenge us as well, and hopefully, we can create that that uh, dialogue and interaction that spawns improvement. And we cannot do this on our own. So our supply chain and partners, and generally in nuclear, we do have long-term relationships. We need to work those relationships. You know, I, I regularly speak to the key CEOs of, of, of our suppliers um, and we need to be bold together. OK, no, thanks, Alan. Um, we've got an interesting question here, which doesn't necessarily fit in with our mission, but it is very much linked to the end states of the sites. Um, and I suppose it's 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 about new nuclear build in all its forms. So uh, for those on the call who, who may be unaware we we do some of our sites are adjacent to operating power stations some of them are uh, adjacent to new nuclear build um and maybe more of them might be in the future um uh, and that's government policy on new nuclear build which is separate to our mission but the question basically i think alan is about new nuclear build in all its forms so smrs you know small modular reactors advanced uh, modular reactors, uh, fusion, you know, prototype fusion yep. reactors, which are, we're in play now and they're looking for sites for that. So I suppose the question is, you know, what is the NDA's policy on making land available uh, once it is no long, you know, once we've decommissioned or it's no longer needed as part of the decommissioning? Let me give you a bit of a personal view on this. Um, and I, and, I'll, and I'll, I will say what the, the, the company view and the official line is. But for me, my career was built up in petrochemicals and be building uh, plastics plants, but plants that made plastic bottles, because at the time in the 80s and 90s, it was all the rage to have plastic bottles for your water. And then in 2005, I joined British Energy as Director of Projects. And from that point on, I was hooked to, to renewable energy. And I spent five years there as director of projects and then moved on to Hinkley Point C as the deputy project director in Hinkley Point C and spent three good years there. Um, and then moved to Viridor Waste Management, a conventional waste company. And again, focused on zero waste to landfill. And during that time, oversaw the building of 10 energy recovery power stations. So it's in my DNA, and then now with the NDA, I've saw the full loop of nuclear and the importance and interconnectedness of each part of our industry. We all need to work together. So that brings me to new nuclear. 
you know, our view is we do what the our our um, our owner Bez, the HMG uh, desire. We work within f fairly uh, tight restrictions. You know, we can't just go off and do anything we want. We need instruction to do that. And New Nuclear, we've not been asked to do that yet. So, um, but I think there is opportunity. Personally, I think there is opportunity to look at how do we use the nuclear license sites? You know, how do we power the new GDF? Um, if I look at my time with Viridor, the decentralization of power is going to be something, a mega trend that we're going to see. So small modular reactors, 230, 200 to 300 megawatts, sound pretty good. Um, I think, you know, there's a there's a small nuclear reactor at MIT in the centre of Boston. So I believe people can get comfortable with them. Um, and I think the fusion technology is fantastic because of the, the, the lack of a nuclear waste, if you like. Um, the ITER project down in the south of France fascinates me. I'd love to work in that job. Um, we've got Cullum at uh, Harwell. And so I think these technologies are really important for the country. I started with saying nuclear power is important to the globe. Um, yeah, they take a lot of concrete, but we need to deal with that. We need to find a way of dealing with that. Um, but the emissions side is really good. I think the small stuff, yeah, well, if we can power nuclear subs, surely to goodness we can take them on shore and generate some electricity. So I think I'm I'm a personal, and we will wait to see what our direction is, and we're happy to do whatever we need to do. There is an opportunity there, but uh, hopefully, you know, the nuclear industry is seen as important by the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's a great answer, Alan. It, it, you're correct, really. We are we are guided by a sponsoring department in government, and our mission is to clean up uh, nuclear legacy quite clearly. But if we are directed in that direction to give land over for new projects, then obviously uh, we we would we would abide by that. I suppose it's also uh, worth mentioning at that point because we may may well have some community representatives on the. Uh, on the webinar today and I, I hope we do have but it is about engagement and dialogue with the local communities as well because that whole socio-economic piece is about how the those eco those those uh, areas um thrive um with their own economies you know even post-nuclear you know when the nuclear industry is left so so the, the community should also have a say i suppose in in what happens to that land and and some some communities may well want new nuclear power stations we've seen that other communities may may not as well but uh, obviously that's all part of that dialogue as well but no thanks for the answer alan um we don't normally take uh, comments it's normally questions that we thrive on in these events but there is a comment which i just wanted to draw your attention to Alan. Um, so it's a comment from Philip and he's saying the opportunity of linking sustainability and digital is a point well made. He said, I will take the link to the Nuclear Institute Digital Community Special Interest Group where we have excellent representation with NDA and the SLCs along with the supply chain. So just a comment there just about that point about sustainability mm -hmm. and, and digitization. So I just thought I'd bowl that one in. So back to the questions. We've still got time for some more Um uh so let me see a uh, question here well there was a question generally about your comments about linkage and cross-sector working with the oil and gas industry so i just wondered if you could just say a few more words about that alan how, how we're going to do that and what benefits are in it for us as nuclear decommission decommissioners and, and also what benefits are in it for the offshore oil and gas industry okay so when I one of the things that I've sold my career is that, you know, whether you're working in nuclear or, or biotechnology or oil and gas, there's always expertise, but there's a huge amount of synergy. Mm. And a pipe and a pump doesn't know whether it's in the middle of the North Sea or it's in a nuclear power station. That, that you know, so there's a lot of synergy and I think the industries have been a bit too siloed. Um, certainly, from a decommissioning viewpoint, it's quite embarrassing if you go back to the 1970s and 80s, the amount of thought in a designer's head around how do we decommission this and how do we look at carbon footprint wasn't really in the agenda. So so I think 
you know, those opportunities come from, you know, how can we come up with technology that is cross-transferable? You know, how do we how do we bring our waste streams together? Um, how do we work on environmental issues? How do we create jobs together, you know, in the environmental sector? Because there's going to be a lot more jobs, a lot more scrutiny on environmental impact in the future. And this this also goes into offshore wind as well, the offshore wind industry, and how they will be decommissioned. So I believe that the expertise and the legacy that we've got in decommissioning can be taken into other industries. Stuff we're building just now will eventually need to be decommissioned. You know, um, it's it's that thinking, and also the cultural aspect of having operator or an oil and gas plant or a nuclear plant that, that transition to become demolition woman or demolition man. It's quite a difficult journey. So there's lots to share in, in how we go about things. And even if we, there's no, the opportunity small, I would like to say at least we looked. And I believe there is opportunity in the north of Scotland. Could we build another low level uh, repository in, in Dunray? I don't know. Need to discuss that with SEPA. Um, but, but dragging an oil rig to Turkey or or Singapore or or, or or Bangladesh doesn't seem like the right environmental solution to me. And I think, you know, we need to lift our eyes above just our own industry to look at how we can interconnect with others. The digital point's huge. I mean, we are not looking enough at digital and the benefits that that will bring. And the information, big data, and how big data can be applied to ensure that we make swifter decisions. So lots of opportunity there, John. Yeah, no, thanks, Alan. Well, listen, we'll, we'll have to wrap it up quite soon. And I'm just conscious we're getting so many fantastic questions coming through. Uh, uh, and we could probably go on for two hours here. But just, just one quick question, I suppose. And we'll have to make it quick, I suppose, just before we wrap up. But um, there was just one question quite specific. Can you give any examples of energy efficiency projects being executed right now in 2021? So I suppose if you could just off the top of your head, just just mention one project that's uh, close to your heart, that would probably suffice with the shortage of time that we've got. Yeah, the, we, we, I know it sounds, a lot of companies have been down this before, they're just bringing in solar panels to our buildings. I mean, um, it's just part of the culture of thinking that way. So small steps, but they're good steps. Um, I think in the, the macro scale, really looking at a long-term energy strategy and bringing in expertise from, you know, people like National Grid on Electricity Matters and, and UK Power Networks, these organisations, bringing in expertise from the water industry and our water usage. So, but from an energy viewpoint, each of the businesses are now, they've now all got targets for energy reduction and they're all now putting it together. What I would say is that we need to make sure that we build in um, our young people into this so that they feel part of the decision making because they're going to inherit all this. Yeah. No, that's great. Well, th thank you very much for that, Alan. And, and thanks again for the presentation today and, and taking so many questions. Uh, we, we really appreciate it. Just before we wrap up, actually, I was going to say a few things, but actually, firstly, I ought to say there are a couple of voting buttons, so you can vote on a couple of questions as delegates. Uh, and it is really useful feedback for us when we put these webinars on. So one, one of, the of the questions, questions which should be coming up in front of you um, quite soon is, did the content of today's webinar meet your expectations? I mean, did it give you more than you expected? Was it spot on or did you want more detail? That was one question. Uh, secondary question was, uh, would you attend a similar hosted event like this again in the future? I hope the answer to that is yes, but it can be a yes, a no, or a maybe. So if you could, when you get the chance, just uh, vote with your voting buttons on both of those questions, that would be really great. Um, so, uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, I, th I think you'll agree with me. That was a, a really interesting session, a fantastic subject to talk about. We, we, we could really have done with uh, with two hours, I'm sure you'll know, but we've, we've all got busy uh, schedules and we, we all have other meetings to go to. So we're trying to wrap it up uh, 
on time. It's a fascinating topic. Uh, thanks really to Alan again on behalf of all of us uh, for the presentation and answering the questions. I'd like to also say thank you to Marek Communications, our, our communications PR company. Uh, they've done a fantastic job in uh, in producing and managing this event. So a lot of work goes on in the background. So thanks again to the guys at Marek. Many of you will know Marek, I'm sure, in the industry. So they've done a great job. So thanks again for the team there. Um, and I suppose just finally, I'd like to say thank you to all the delegates that have turned up, really. I mean, it, it, it is hectic, but it is, you know, in our theme of our safety message going back there, keeping connected, keeping connected and talking to each other is hugely beneficial through, um, you know, the the, res the, res the restrictions that we're all living through at the moment. So it's really got a, a huge value. And, and thank you for giving up your time to uh, to take part in this. And thank you for some fabulous questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get around to answering all of them, but we did do our best. Uh, so thank you for, for turning up. Um, and, and making it such a, uh, an energized session. I would just finally say that we, are, we have recorded this session, so we will send a recording of it out to all of the delegates if you uh, ever think like you could face sitting through it again uh, or you want to pick up on any points or come back to us, please do that via me uh, through my email address, which is john.mcnamara at nda.gov.uk. Uh, but we will send the link out to that recording. So thanks again for everyone taking part. I would just say finally, please, please stay safe. Um, keep yourself well. Keep talking to each other. And we look forward to engaging with you in the future at another one of these events. So thank you very much for attending. And enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.